Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. It has been an extremely difficult year for U.S. relations with China. From the coronavirus to a trade war, relations with the country are very strained. And before recent controversies ever emerged, China was involved in human rights abuses at home and very controversial practices that affect people all over the world. My guest is a China expert, James Milward of Georgetown University. Jim, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, it's my pleasure. Good to have you here today. Th this issue uh, is so important and I'm so glad that we have uh, ha about a half hour to talk about a host of things today. Mm -hmm. I, I want to start with uh, some alarming uh, conditions in China. NPR recently reported on actions against uh, human rights activists. One prominent civil rights lawyer in particular uh, has been detained uh, as of our taping after spending two months on the run. Uh, not talking about that particular case, but in general, what do you make of, of what the Chinese government has been doing in recent years to fight against folks who are trying to improve conditions for people mm -hmm. in the country? Yeah, well, we've seen over the last several years, certainly since Xi Jinping became the general secretary of the party, but actually even beginning a little before that, you know, what we refer to as a, as a crackdown or as a real tightening up uh, on space for dissidents, on space for you know, uh, academic freedom, uh, on, on space for citizen journalists to talk about things, and of course, you know, civil rights uh, activism of all sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and besides the case you mentioned, there's been a host of civil rights lawyers who've been harassed or detained. Um, the uh, feminist five, as they were sometimes called, five women who spoke, started to speak out, um, they were uh, sort of clamped down on. And of course, there's all the in internet censorship of all sorts, and, and the, the state capability to do that has increased greatly. And um, a couple ways to look at this. I mean, one is China does go through cycles of of opening up and, and, and contracting and, and opening and closing and, and, and you know, loosening up the, the space for conversation and then tightening it up again. Um, so sometimes you might see that sort of cyclical, but I think really it's, um, it's deeper than that. And certainly what's been going on in the last few years is, is unprecedented. And, um, you know, often you see comparisons made to the Cultural Revolution or other things like that. And uh, it's hard to know exactly why that is. I think one reason is uh, perhaps because with globalization, with all the greater changes you know, in the world, um, with, with China's rise, um, you know, we're seeing China's strength, um, but also there's a lot of vulnerabilities and, and the Chinese people are much more knowledgeable about the world, traveling back and forth. Uh, it's much, it really is harder despite all of the digital capability and so on that the party has, it is harder to keep people in a bubble, mm. right? And so I think that uh, Xi Jinping is thinking that uh, for the Communist Party to stay in power, to remain as the exclusive authority in China, will require these kinds of draconian measures and, and controls on, on, on information, controls on thinking even. And uh, it, so although not coming entirely from him in this, as an individual, I think his uh, the rise to the, to the supreme leadership and of course, he's now um, the equivalent of president for life, right? Because he's changed the constitution to allow him to serve multiple terms. Uh, that really is the marker. And, and this is an important to, distinction to make um, because uh, in, in the conversation now about China and, and particularly in US-China relations, sometimes it's said, oh, engagement failed. Uh, you know, all of the policies we've had for the last you know, 40 years have, have come to nothing and, and China's as bad as it always was. And that's completely untrue. And anyone who's been to China, obviously you see the physical changes, but if you talk to people, you can see how 
much more attuned they are you know, to the world and you know, traveling around and watching the same sitcoms and so on that, mm -hmm. that, that you know, we, we've grown up on and that our kids are watching and so on. So it's a very, very different uh, country now and a very, very different uh, people now. So I think what we're seeing is in a sense a reaction by the party uh, to the very positive changes that have happened over the last 40 years. So this uh, human rights activist uh, who is being detained as of this taping had one last blog post before his detention grieving the death of a whistleblower doctor who uh, has since died who was uh, reprimanded for warning others about the coronavirus. What do you make of how China has handled, is handling uh, the coronavirus crisis? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, any you know, major epidemiological problem like this is going to be a handful for any for any country, and you know, um, hopefully, we will be able to avoid similar sorts of scenes and situations in the United States. If you know, as is now predicted, we will we will get uh, you know a spread of cases in the United States. But you know, um, preparation of protective gear, of masks, and this kind of thing. You know, we may not be in such good situation ourselves in that. So. You know, cross, knock wood, cross our fingers about that. In any case, so, so some of just the, there is a certain amount of inevitable, inevitable chaos that's going to go along with a crisis that is emerging as quickly as, as this has. And I think we really have to give a lot of benefit of the doubt um, to authorities in China for that. Do you that, think but there that said, will be demonstrable change in China as a result of this? Because certainly uh, we've heard that the origin of this, it was believed to be uh, at one of these markets where there right. are live animals, horrendous uh, hygiene I issues in the sale of, uh, of live and dead animals. Uh, do you think that will lead there to change? Yeah, well, let me say a, a couple things. So uh -huh. um, b besides giving China the benefit of the doubt, I think the, the issue of, uh, of, of controls of information that I was just talking about mm -hmm. are central to this. And this is what Chinese people in social media and what the dissident you mentioned and, and Dr. Li Wenliang, uh, you know, he, he raised the, the, the issue. He was trying to bring, it, bring attention to it more mm -hmm. broadly and he was shut down by local police. And in, in the, the, the general assumption, not just by foreign scholars looking at this, but by people in China is that you know, local authorities who are afraid of something that would embarrass them, something that would get them in trouble with their higher ups in Beijing that might interrupt an important meeting that was going to be happening, that they just wanted to put the lid on this, but as a result, the disease, they put the lid on the information, but the disease got out, mm. right? And so this, uh, <clears throat> the political system that suppresses or, or strongly controls information that way and has no safe channels outside of the party itself for communicating information, no independent journalism, that kind of thing. You know, that is the, the bigger root of the problem. Now you mentioned the, the, the infamous markets, right? And um, you know, I've been to some of those. I will say, if, you, if you're a tourist in China, they're, one of the, they're really interesting to go to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's been a little bit of um, some exaggeration about what they're, what they're like, um, just in terms of the kinds of animals and the number of of uh, wild animals and so on that you see in, in some of them. I, I haven't been to the particular one at, uh, um, at issue here in, in Wuhan, but it's called a seafood market. And so if you don't imagine rows and rows of cages of exotic animals, although there may be some there, and insofar as there are, particularly endangered species like the pangolin, like civet cats, you know, they certainly should not be openly uh, sold. They should not be trafficked. There are big problems in, in Thailand and other places where they're, you know, um, coming from, and this is in violation of many international uh, conventions. So, so that certainly should be shut down. And I think now there, there have been campaigns from, central government campaigns in China, um, discouraging people from, um, from eating them. Some very scary sets of, of posters and so on showing people with very sad looking animals. So there will be some kind of campaign. I mean, um, these things are off and on, and I think it, it, they are kind of demand-driven, unfortunately, right? Yeah. And so, so it, um, a few years ago, the basketball player Yao Ming had a campaign about, I believe it was elephant ivory. Um, that had some success in, in turning people against buying that, against consuming these kinds of products. So, so things like that, I think, would be good. Um, but, you know, as far as eliminating 
We should eliminate the trade in endangered species and in these wild animals. Wet markets themselves are, I think, they can be cleaned up, they can be handled in a good way, but um, we shouldn't think of them as, uh, you know, horrible, uh, you know, cesspools of, of mm. disease and so on. They're, they're not, you know, generally that, 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 that bad, I yeah. think. Well, we'll but I'm not an epidemiologist, yeah. nor, nor am I someone who sells fish in a wet market. Right. We'll have to see as time goes on. It'll be very interesting to see long term, especially after the ramifications of the coronavirus, if it is indeed proven that this was the origin uh, right. of this problem. You know, in writing about uh, the detention of the human rights activist, NPR notes that China has invested heavily in digital surveillance and laced its cities uh, with cameras equipped with facial recognition. You have written about China as what you call a surveillance state. Tell me about that. So I've written in particular about the Xinjiang region, which is far northwestern part of China. It's geographically and ethnographically Central Asia. Uh, and there, over the last several years, uh, China has, has built out these systems, but they have them in all major cities of China, and they involve facial recognition. They involve a lot of uh, use of the cell phone as really the, the, the key point of, of surveillance, because of course cell phone can track where you're going. Uh, if you, they can put a nanny app on it that keeps track of everything that's on there. They can download everything and check it. And now AI is good enough, they can you know, check it for keywords and any text on your phone, and they, they can even check it for pictures. So, so in Xinjiang, they're very concerned about Islam, uh, excessively so, and they've been looking for any kind of Islamic symbols or Arabic writing on people's phones, and they can do that through simply scanning or even sniffing a phone re remotely. And why are they so concerned about Islam? Well, this is another, I mean, this is obviously uh, another question uh, which we'll um, I don't know if you want to get to it now in our conversation, but uh, the issue in, uh, in Xinjiang, as China, as the Chinese Communist Party sees it, uh, is that uh, Islam is the source of, uh, of dissent, of, of people being unhappy with uh, the policies of the Chinese Communist and, Party. And the extremes to which the Chinese government uh, has gone, it goes far beyond surveillance. You are here at New Mexico State University talking specifically about China's internment of an ethnic minority. Tell us about that. Right, so there are actually not just one, I mean one major uh, indigenous group in the region who are known as the Uyghurs, but there are also uh, Kazakh and Kyrgyz and, and Chinese Muslims, uh, and even um, Mongol people um, who are all Chinese citizens, but have various ethnicities other than Han, which is the majority ethnicity of the People's Republic of China. And <clears throat> this is a region that was brought under the control of the Qing Empire in the 18th century, uh, and then reacquired by the People's Republic of China uh, in 1949, as they took over uh, you know, other parts of, of China as well. And um, since then, there have been uh, occasional uh, problems uh, in the region, uh, not as much as you might think, actually. And, and one of the reasons for this, not as much as you might think, given that there's a very marked eth ethnic difference and there is this colonial history of the region and so on. But one of the reasons that uh, it has been uh, relatively well integrated and relatively peaceful uh, over the last 70 years um, is that the, the People's Republic of China, when it came to power, implemented a, its own version of um, diversity programs of kind of, of a, a kind of multicultural system, a diversity regime, the scholars call it, uh, a way of managing diversity in their own uh, authoritarian single party state. And it's very different from our own sort of liberal system in the way of mm -hmm. talking about it. They identify exactly how many ethnic groups there are, and there are 56, the Han and all the others, uh, and then channel resources, uh, encourage education, encourage the arts. Uh, particularly cultural activities uh, for each of those groups as those groups and your, your ethnic identity is on your, uh, on your, your identity card. Um, and so you sort of go through life with that being a very important part of who you are. Um, and you know, young people, for example, if they're mixed marriages, they, they choose at 18 which they're going to be. You have to choose. So there's a certain amount of choice there. But other than that, it is very much you know, a category that you, that you live with and that the state uses to organize organized people. Now, um, 
That may sound very rigid, and, and, and it is, uh, but what it did do was provide a measure of support for minority groups and protection against uh, uh, being swamped by the majority and against the tyranny of the majority kinds of, kinds of issues. Uh, and, and by and large, this, this system was supported by minority peoples, including the Uyghurs and others uh, in, in Xinjiang. But then there became problems. Well, what's happened in the last few years, uh, as uh, I mentioned Xi Jinping coming yeah. you know, to power, in the last few years, they've been, the, the Chinese Communist Party has been um, distancing itself, certainly from the spirit, and here and there even from the letter of this whole system of, of, of um, this ethnicity system that they've used. Um, and rather than celebrating the differences and the diversity of China, the, the thrust of propaganda and of uh, education in particular has been aimed at creating uh, the image of and trying to create a homogeneous Chinese population that speaks Chinese primarily, uh, that celebrates certain uh, Chinese festivals, such as the, the Lunar New Year, um, that is less interested in their own uh, non-Chinese religion or customs, such as Ramadan, for example. Uh, and, then that, and that, of course, loves the Chinese Communist Party. And this is the image of the new kind of perfect Chinese citizen that is being created through a raft of, of programs and policies and propaganda. And what are, what are the consequences for folks who oppose those measures? Well, so one of the aspects of this program has been the, uh, what's called the signification of religion or the sort of making sure that religion is Chinese, right? And that applies to Christianity, it applies to, uh, or Catholicism, Protestantism, it applies to Islam, um, it applies to Tibetan Buddhism, right, across the board. In particular, in the case of Islam, and in particular in the case of the Uyghurs uh, in the Central Asian former colony, um, that uh, Islam is seen as a source of the, of the problem. And, and in particular, it's seen as a source of extremism, as a source of potential terrorism, uh, and, and a reason for why there has been uh, unrest uh, in, in the region. And um, most scholars looking at this from outside of China would say that uh, you know, th there are ethno-national reasons for, for unrest. Uh, it's not all religion. It's hard, of course, to untangle religion from the ethnicity mm -hmm. of the Uyghur peoples. But that in singling out religion and, and focusing in on that, and in particular, mundane practice of religion, such as fasting during Ramadan, uh, such as um, modest dress or a headscarf for, for women, things like that. By singling those things out, the policies of the Communist Party have made things, uh, have made things worse uh, over the past few years, to the point where now they've decided to implement a massive system of internment uh, and re-education within coerced camps mm. uh, to try to extirpate what they see as a virus of extremism from people's, from people's heads. And of course, it's very ironic that now we're, we're talking about uh, thought viruses uh, in, in Xinjiang for the last few years, and now we're facing a real virus. And some of the same policies of you know, quarantining and uh, draconian uh, uh, restrictions on movement and things like that are actually being applied both to coronavirus uh, infected areas and to the supposedly thought virus infected areas of Xinjiang. And of course, and this the is surveillance I'm state and the AI and the phone and QR cards and facial recognition, yeah. and all of that is being used right now for coronavirus uh, cases and, and circumstances as and well. For so many people watching this, this is probably the first time that they've heard about internment occurring in China. The United States has such strong uh, economic ties with China in, in the midst of the enormous human rights abuses that are going on. What does this say about China's power? And also, what does it say to you about the U.S. government? So, you know, many years ago, you know, two or three decades ago, um, the conversation about China was, you know, should we trade with China um, even though they have, there are these human rights abuses, how do we leverage trade to try to get China to improve its human rights situation, right? Well, um, and, and we had an annual renewal of, of China's status, which was required in order to allow uh, trade with, with China on, uh, on, on you know, with lower tariffs and so on, right? Well, um, Bill Clinton ended that um, by eliminating that annual renewal, and soon after that, 
um, the U.S. Uh, got out of the way and allowed for China's accession to the World Trade Organization. So China has been, uh, you know, since that time, integrated in the global economy, and we all know, you know, the results. That most of the things that we buy are, are made from China. So um, the idea that, uh, you know, horrible as what's going on in Xinjiang is, and it is horrible. Um, it's, it's opposed to American values. It's opposed to human human values. Um, but the idea that that we're going to not trade with China, or you know, that this is feasible or desirable, is unfortunately not. You know, that's not really a good idea. It, it's, it's not a practical uh, approach. Um, but does it scare you? And, and the kind just, of I'm power sorry, that we're Fred. talking about, yeah. because you know, a lot of people watching this program uh, don't know uh, the the acceleration of power that goes so far beyond you know the fact as you correctly point out that much of the uh, very inexpensive items that we purchase are mm -hmm. produced in mm -hmm. China uh, they don't know that General Motors as an example sells more cars in China than they do in in North America right. so and so the, the I mean, power is just it, it's, it's not just, just the uh, inexpensive enormous. things it's you know yeah. it's, it's the parts of everything it's the parts yeah. of our iPhones right yeah. everything else so so the economies are very integrated um, and you know I just you know the, the tariff war which you know is an ongoing too it was not launched with any of this in mind right it was not launched right. because of human rights sorts of things just to, to make that clear um, so I think you know we need to think of ways to approach China to, to make the, our messages and concerns about these clear. Um, and which, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, um, th there, were with, there, there was a law passed about, uh, uh, about Hong Kong um, some months ago. There's a law that's now waiting final reconciliation. Um, it's been, versions have been passed by both the House uh, and the Senate. Um, uh, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act uh, it's the name of the Senate version, and that contains various things. It calls on, in particular, it, it allows for the use of what's known as global Magnitsky sanctions. Um, and these are sanctions that allow uh, Treasury and Finance Departments in particular, and State Department, I think, as well, to target individual officials who are implementing policies that are uh, you know, violating human rights in extreme ways like this. Um, and it, you know, it can, it can confiscate their, uh, uh, their finances abroad, perhaps it can limit their travel to the United States and, and, and other sorts of things like that. So, um, you know, it, it's not a broadside attack on China economically. They're not across the board economic sanctions that hurt everybody else uh, and hurt the wrong people. Um, some have said they might even be symbolic, but if, for example, the you know, the current head of the Xinjiang region, the party head of the Xinjiang region, who is responsible for rolling out concentration camps and this surveillance system. Um, targeting him would be, yes, symbolic, but very, very important. Do you, do you have any thought that this could actually occur? It's, it has bipartisan, bipartisan support so in it both may. houses. And it, um, again, it's waiting reconciliation. We're, we're yeah. quickly running out of time. Okay. I want to get your assessment of the effectiveness of what the Trump administration has done with a trade war, which now they've sort of backed off on a bit, but Thoughts on that? Yeah. So very quickly, the I think the, the president's idea of the person of, of, of the purpose of the trade war was to address trade imbalances. Mm -hmm. And an economist will tell you that's really not that much of a problem with trade imbalances. And certainly um, with China, you know, we shouldn't worry about them. Um, and the tariffs they hasn't addressed that trade imbalances. Actually, the imbalance has increased uh, during this time. Um, it has been used. The tariffs have been used as a way of putting some pressure um, on China in negotiations about intellectual property rights uh, and opening markets uh, more evenly, evening the playing field. And those are indeed imp important issues that should be pursued. Um, whether the tariff wars, again, that hurt all the wrong people is the way to do it, is, is another question. Um, and in fact, we haven't really, even though there was an initial phase agreement made, uh, which sort of stopped another, I believe, $250 billion set of tariffs from being put on there. Um, it hasn't really addressed those thorniest issues. It's simply gotten a promise from China to buy some more so soybeans, right? So, um, so unfortunately, the tariff war is not really the way to address these. What would have been a good way to do it would have been um, through TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which had been negotiated at great length uh, in the previous administration in which President Trump uh, uh, tore up 
in one of his first acts in office. And what that did was basically give the United States a whole range of allies in our economic dealings with China. It wasn't NAFTA for China. China was not part of it. That was the point, the strategic, but it gave us a lot of strategic weight in dealing about these issues with our, with our good allies. It's going to be fascinating to see uh, how this all plays out because it, it certainly was extremely disruptive uh, to the markets and I extremely disruptive in the United States, as you know, to uh, individual families, particularly mm -hmm. farmers, who now are going to be getting help from the U.S. taxpayer uh, in the billions of dollars. $25 billion, yeah. and I think there's another round of, um, of yeah, and you know, you don't, you do feel bad for the, for the, for the farmers, and, and I don't begrudge them that help, but um, it's much larger than, for example, the bailout of the audio industry after 2008, and we just, just should know that we are paying for this. And Plus, it was created. <laughs> it was created, exactly. Right. It's, it's, it's an own goal, as yeah. they call it. Yeah. So interesting. I wish we had an hour. Can you believe a half hour has gone by, and we didn't even get to China's a big place. There's all a lot of to talk the about. topics yeah. that yeah. I wanted to talk about, but both you and I have seen the uh, Oscar award-winning documentary American mm. Factory on Netflix, and I think we both would encourage people to watch it. It's a fascinating look at how a, a Chinese company came into a former General Motors plant in the United States in Dayton, Ohio, and the cultural clash that occurred as, as a result. Something very interesting. And can to I look add just one thing? On yeah. That. So there, that's that. But then it take, the movie takes an interesting turn, and 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 it's a bit of a spoiler alert here. But um, we see how automation is affecting the factory in yes. China. And yes. the razor thin margins at which the Chinese company is operating. Um, and we realize this is going to affect China as much or more than it will the United States. It, it is. And it this is. is a way in which US China we have very similar problems. Global warming, automation, pandemics. Yeah. And this is why relations between US China really can't we can't afford for them to be, you know, to fritter away years and years uh, in, in, in enmity. Yeah, it, it, it really shows us uh, one example of why understanding uh, our global community um, and having a, an understanding of foreign relations and the importance of foreign relations is so important. James, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you at home as well. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition, 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by Here and Now, noon to 2, and All Things Considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org. We'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.